Everything just seemed to be going well in Sylvia's life. She was happy running the store, and in 1990, when the lease was up, Sylvia was going to sell the store and move to Hawaii to join her brother. But unfortunately, on Tuesday, October 31st, 1989, all of Sylvia's plans would end. Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So welcome to episode 27. We are so close to episode 30, which is absolutely insane. Thank you guys so much for the support that you guys have shown this podcast. You guys are helping me spread awareness on these cases and I'm so grateful. Today, we're gonna be talking about what happened to 30-year-old Sylvia Salinas. Now, this one really frightened me. It happened in broad daylight on Halloween, which is just incredibly eerie. It's not only eerie because it happened on Halloween, but it's also scary the way Sylvia's body was found and the circumstances involving her case. There's also very little coverage on Sylvia. There's only maybe 10, 12 articles that talk about this. So it was really hard to gather information for this video. However, even though there is very little information to share, I still think that it's important to spread awareness on this case. So with that, let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Sylvia Salinas. Sylvia Salinas was born on January 7, 1959 in Galveston, Texas to Darlis Peña Salinas and Maria Elena Salinas. Her parents were from La Hacienda de Guadalupe, Mexico, but they had moved to Galveston, Texas, where they raised their family. They raised Sylvia and her three siblings, Darles Jr., Lenora, and Jose Ruben. In 1989, when this case occurred, the population of Galveston was about 62,000 people. So it was a pretty small town, but it also used to be very popular. A lot of tourists would frequently come in and out of the town, and it also used to feel relatively safe back then. Nowadays, Galveston does have a higher crime rate, but back then, people felt very comfortable there. So let's talk a little bit about the Salinas family. At least the father was employed by the Port of Galveston and also worked on the railroad. I believe Maria was a stay-at-home mom and both parents encouraged their children to embrace their Mexican heritage and they would speak Spanish at the house. That way the kids would be bilingual. The Salinas family were devoted Catholics and they would all attend mass at a nearby church every single Sunday together. The family was also really close to each other. They all had a very beautiful and loving relationship and the siblings got along really well. In the early 70s, Sylvia's brother, Derlis Jr., decided to do something bold. He bought a small grocery store at 3028 Avenue Q, which is in the same neighborhood that they grew up in. Now this store was on the corner of the street and he named it Salinas Food Store. Derlis Jr. was really excited about this store and it was pretty much a family-run business. He ran the store for a period of time and then his parents took over running the store. Eventually, Silvia also joined in on the family business and she started working as a manager for the store in 1978. She was a manager at the store for for about 10 years and Sylvia absolutely loved it there. She was so happy being a part of the family business and she just loved the store, the customers, the environment, and just the job itself. In 1985, Sylvia, who was 26 years old at the time, moved out of her parents' house and moved in with her close friend, Cynthia Marsh. Now, everything seemed to be going well in Sylvia's life. You know, she was working at the family store, she was living with her best friend, and she was just always surrounded by the people she cared about the most. At one point, Derlis Jr. sold the store and he sold it to his parents who then ran it for some time. And then in 1988, Sylvia decided to purchase the store from her parents and she became the official owner of Salinas Food Store. You know, at this point, she had been working as a manager there for more than 10 years and she was so amazing at her job. It just made sense for her to take over the lease. Now, she was really excited about this, but she knew that this wasn't going to last forever. The lease for the store was expiring in 1990, and the family had decided that when their lease ended, they were actually going to sell the family business. In the meantime, while they waited for the lease to end, Sylvia remained dedicated to the store, and everyone in the community could just feel her passion for this. Over the years, she had become a beloved member of her community, and she was pretty well known by people in the area. Close friends would call her Syl, while kids in the neighborhood and her nieces and nephews would call her Auntie Syl or Tia Syl in Spanish. 
Now, based on interviews I was able to find, people really loved going to the store, not only because of the products that they offered, but because of Sylvia. She was really good with the customers, she was very helpful, and she was just very kind. She would advance credit against paychecks for groceries, something that other grocery stores in Galveston had stopped doing years prior to this. And I've also read statements from people saying that they used to go to the store when they were younger and that they just have really good memories of Sylvia working behind the counter. They say that she was just incredibly helpful and that they could call ahead and tell Sylvia exactly what they wanted. And she would grab all the things for them, put it in a little basket and then have it ready for you when you came to the store so that you could pick it up and leave instead of shopping for it yourself. I feel like not a lot of store owners do that. So that just shows how incredibly kind Sylvia was. She didn't just see the customers as income. You know, she actually saw them as people and she would talk to them, get to know them and offer them support. She loved to joke around with people and she was just known for being very charming in the way that she dealt with customers. If kids would come into her store who didn't have enough money to pay for candy or for snacks, Sylvia would help them out. Now, just because Sylvia was very kind and caring didn't mean that she would let people walk all over her. If there was a customer in the store acting rowdy and rude, Sylvia would put an end to it. She would act rough with these customers and she just didn't want to accept any type of bad behavior in her store. You know, her store was meant to be a welcoming and safe place for people in the community to come and shop and Sylvia would do her best to make sure that it remained that way. People in the community say that she had so many friends and that she was always making new friends. She was just so bubbly and happy and one of her closest friends named Deborah said that she couldn't think of anyone who didn't like Sylvia and that she really had no enemies. Again, everything just seemed to be going well in Sylvia's life. She was happy running the store and in 1990 when the lease was up, Sylvia was going to sell the store and move to Hawaii to join her brother. But unfortunately, on Tuesday, October 31st, 1989, all of Sylvia's plans would end. Before we continue with the case, let's hear from our sponsors at Factor who make this podcast possible. Guys, fall is here and I'm already so busy with planning all sorts of fun fall events. That's why I have been relying on Factor, America's number one ready to eat meal kit to help me fuel up fast with chef prepared, dietitian approved, ready to eat meals delivered straight to my door. And so should you. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy this fall to cook, but wanna make sure that you're eating well? I feel you. With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready to eat in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy, and then go back to crushing your goals. Adjust your stride this autumn without missing a step. You can choose from 35 plus weekly flavor-packed, fresh, never frozen meals that promote a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences all ready to eat within two minutes. Make sure to relish the best of autumn with fall flavors. Factors limited time only, hearty, comforting meals featuring seasonal veggies, including meals such as cranberry pecan chicken and apple Dijon pork chops. Ready in just two minutes, they'll satisfy your fall cravings during the busy season without the hassle. Level up with gourmet plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, lean, Leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Head to factormeals.com slash whathappen50 and use code whathappen50 to get 50% off. That's code whathappen50 at factormeals.com slash whathappen50 to get 50% off. Now let's hear from our sponsors at Newly who make this podcast possible. Fall is here and I'm excited to put together some comfy, cozy, and stylish outfits with the help of Newly. Newly is a subscription clothing rental service. For just $98 a month, you can get trending fall pieces delivered right to your doorstep without dropping any serious cash. Whether you like cute tailored blazers, chunky knits, or formal dresses for dates, Newly is your new go-to outfit for every occasion. With Newly, you get to choose Choose six styles each month, so you can pick and choose what your vibe is going to be for that month. You also get access to thousands of styles from more than 400 brands, everything from party dresses to premium denim and one-of-a-kind vintage pieces. Newly carries labels like Free People, Selkie, Farm Rio, Anthropology, Eloki, Madewell, and A Goldie. Newly offers inclusive sizing up to 5X as well as petite plus maternity, so they're truly for everyone. Newly also 
also offers fast, free shipping and returns and professional cleaning in Newly's state-of-the-art laundering facility. So you get all the clothes, but no laundry to worry about. And you always have the option to buy something if you really love it, sometimes up to 70% off. Renting from Newly means getting to wear more while spending less, so you can avoid the shopping spree splurges to find the perfect fit before an important event and feel confident and excited that your wardrobe already has all the variety you need. Newly values sustainability and lets you love fashion in a way that's kinder on the planet. Orders are shipped in recycled, recyclable, and reusable totes with no plastic packaging. Clothes are cleaned using energy and water-efficient methods, and styles are repaired rather than thrown out. Plus, Newly is super flexible. There are no fees, late fees, damage fees, or fees to pause or cancel. So no big deal if you lose a button, spill something, or just need to take a break. Life happens and Newly understands. Newly is a great value at $98 a month for any six styles, but right now you can get $20 off your first month of Newly when you sign up with the code WHATHAPPEN20. Just go to n u u l y.com, that's Newly with two U's, and enter the code WHATHAPPEN20 and sign up to get $20 off your first month. That's n u u l y.com, Newly with two U's with code WHATHAPPEN20. Newly subscription clothing rental change your clothes. Now, let's get back to the case. That day was Halloween, so it was a pretty busy day in Galveston. People were getting ready to celebrate that night. You know, kids were getting into their costumes, getting their bags ready to go trick-or-treating, and people were setting up their decorations outside of their homes and their stores. As for 30-year-old Sylvia, she woke up that morning and started getting ready to head over to the Salinas food store to go to her usual shift. Now, Halloween can be a little tricky for stores. You know, you can get some really good business that day from people coming in to buy last-minute Halloween. Halloween decorations, you know, buying candy or just buying supplies for a Halloween party that they're hosting. So business can be good that day, but it can also be quite scary. People can get really rowdy on Halloween. There's actually quite a bit of crime that happens on Halloween night. You know, the fact that people are able to walk around wearing costumes, wearing masks and just hiding their true identity leads to a lot of burglaries and chaos. I used to work as a server and I remember on Halloween, we would not be allowed to serve people that were in costumes. If you were wearing a costume, you weren't even allowed to get takeout or go to the bar at the restaurant or anything like that. They just didn't want to run the risk of someone coming into the store, wearing a mask, robbing the place, and then never being caught because of their costume. So Halloween could be quite crazy. Just like many other store owners, Sylvia did put measurements in place to protect herself. She had an alarm system at the store and she also kept a loaded gun as well as a machete underneath her counter. That way, if she was ever in trouble, she could press a silent alarm and she could also reach underneath the counter to grab her weapons. During her shift, Sylvia's parents had stopped by the store for some time to help her out with miscellaneous tasks at the store and they also just wanted to say hi to her. When lunchtime came around, Derlis and Maria left the store and they headed back home to eat some lunch, which was only two blocks away. As for Sylvia, she worked through her lunch, so she spent the hours stocking the shelves and just getting things in order around the store. Now, she was the only person working at the store on Halloween, and apparently she was the only person in the store during lunchtime. No one else in the town can remember being at the store at this time. However, sometime between Sylvia's lunch break and 1.20 p.m., someone did enter the store. And then just three minutes later at 1.23, the silent alarm went off. The silent alarm was linked to a private security firm, so once they were alerted that something had happened, they notified the Galveston Police Department, who then arrived at the store at around 1.27 p.m. So just to recap, all of this had happened within seven minutes. Within seven minutes, someone had entered the store, the silent alarm had been tipped off, and police had arrived at the scene. The police started making their way through the store and one officer named Officer John saw bloody footprints on the floor. He started following the footprints and this led him to the counter where Sylvia would normally sit and run the register. Officer John walked behind the counter and that's when he discovered Sylvia sitting on her stool, slumped over in a pool of her own blood. 
Sylvia Salinas was dead. He called over more officers and that's when they found a large butcher knife near the body covered in blood. This knife was pretty big. It was about nine to 10 inches long. Now it appeared that Sylvia had been stabbed to death and that this knife was the murder weapon. Officers continued looking around and they saw that the cash register was open and that it had blood on it. They came to the conclusion that the killer had used the knife that they used to stab Sylvia to pry the cash register open. The cash register had been emptied out completely except for a couple of coins that were left behind as well as some food stamps. Now, it was also determined that Sylvia wasn't the one who had set off the silent alarm. When the killer was opening the cash register, you know, with the knife, he accidentally triggered the store's silent alarm that informed the police that a robbery was taking place. It was just very intense. You know, this crime scene was very overwhelming for detectives and for people in the community. According to the statements in the police report, they said, quote, the victim was obviously dead. No defensive type wounds are present on the deceased forearms, wrists, or hands. There is one stab wound above the left breast. Now, detectives closed off the store and they began collecting evidence. Along with the butcher knife, they also found the bloody footprints and they also found bloody fingerprints. They gathered a few more pieces of evidence and then they began to try to figure out what had happened, who did this, and why. Police tried to put the pieces together, but by the end of the night, the police did not have any suspects or leads in Sylvia's murder. All they knew was that someone had entered the store at 1.20 p.m., stabbed Sylvia, and then vanished from the store, all within seven minutes. How did the killer get away so quickly? Did they run out of the store? Was there a getaway car outside waiting for them? I mean, seven minutes is really quick. Along with these unanswered questions, police were also trying to determine whether the killer brought the knife or if the knife was already there. The grocery store didn't have a butcher section and detectives actually showed the knife to Sylvia's parents to see if they recognized it, but they didn't. So it seems like either Sylvia brought this herself or the killer did. Investigators initially thought that the motive for this attack was robbery. However, upon further investigation, they started to believe that this was personal that it wasn't just a random burglary. In fact, they believe that the robbery happened only to throw investigators off, or that the robbery happened because the killer had an opportunity to steal money after killing Sylvia. So to them, it seems like money wasn't the target. Sylvia was. Detectives truly felt that Sylvia must have known her killer because she didn't feel threatened enough to pull the silent alarm herself. And as I mentioned earlier, she kept a loaded gun as well as a machete underneath the counter. However, there was no indication that she had reached for either one of those items. So she obviously didn't feel threatened enough with this person. There was also no defensive wounds found. So investigators believe that she must have let her killer get behind the counter with her because they were either a friend or someone she knew. Now her friends and family back up this theory. Her brother Deadliest Jr. confirmed saying, quote, she would not let anybody behind that counter unless she knew that person and felt comfortable with that person. Her best friend, Cynthia, also added to the story and said that Sylvia was a very alerted person and would watch everyone in the store, that she could tell who came into her store and if they were a threat or not. So if a complete stranger had walked into the store, Sylvia would have been watching them and she definitely would have not let this person go behind the counter with her. But since Sylvia was found behind the counter, slumped over in her chair with no defensive wounds, investigators Investigators believe that she was just completely caught off guard by the killer. I mean, a friend could have walked in and Sylvia could have said hi to them and she could have invited them behind the counter and she just wasn't expecting this friend to attack her. So that's why she didn't reach for the weapons or trigger the silent alarm or fight back because she just felt completely comfortable with this person. It's just truly really very creepy and frightening to think about. What made this case really difficult is that there was nobody else in the store at the time of the murder. So there weren't really any witnesses that could help police put together the pieces of this crime. Even though there weren't any witnesses, police and the Salinas family still urged the public to come forward with any information regarding the case. You know, even if no one was in the store at the time of the murder, this happened during lunchtime. People were out and about, you know, getting ready for Halloween. People were going out to eat on their lunch break. And the store was located on a busy street. So maybe someone saw the killer leave or enter the store. Sylvia's friends and family just don't understand how no one could have seen anything. As I mentioned, this community was very small and people were involved in each other's lives and people would just people watch. 
you know, people would sit on their porches hanging out and just watch what was going on in the neighborhood. So how did nobody see that someone ran away from the store covered in blood or ran away from the store in a hurry or just see anything suspicious? A few days after Sylvia's murder, her friend Cynthia and two other friends wrote letters to the editor in newspapers asking people to come forward with any information. They also put together a reward fund to catch Sylvia's killer and they asked the community to help contribute money. I mean, her and Sylvia were best friends. They were basically family. Of course, Cynthia wanted to advocate for her best friend and, you know, help solve this case. She told police that Sylvia had made some new friends in the last six months, some of them from the Houston area, and that she didn't know much about these new friends. So she told police that maybe it was worth looking into. And she also urged those new friends to come forward and talk to detectives about what they knew. Maybe they knew someone in Sylvia's life that had something against her and could have done this. Police were looking into everyone and anyone that could have possibly been near the store the day of the murder or that could have done this. On November 2nd, two days after Sylvia's murder, police brought in a suspect for questioning. This suspect was a man who had been seen walking around with blood on his clothes the day of Sylvia's murder. However, when he was questioned by police, he told them that he had just gotten too drunk and had fallen off the seawall, so the blood was his. Police were able to confirm his story, so he was let go. That same day, Derles Jr., Sylvia's brother, spoke to the media in regards to his sister's case. He said, She wanted to believe in people. She died believing that people are basically good. She would never suspect anyone to hurt her. He also added, If we hadn't sold her the store, she wouldn't have been alone and this wouldn't have happened. And reading that just broke my heart. He shouldn't blame himself for what happened to his sister. I mean, you never imagine that this type of thing is going to happen to your loved one. And it's just so sad that he feels like it's his fault. And it just also makes me so mad that someone did this to Sylvia, someone who was so sweet and welcoming to all customers who entered her store. And the fact that police believe that she was killed by someone she knew just makes this even more disturbing. Along with Derlis Jr., other members of Sylvia's family and friends spoke to the media about her case. It started to gain more traction, and because of this, witnesses started to come forward about what they saw that day. And a couple of witnesses said that they saw a black man dressed in dark clothing who had been seen using the payphone outside of the store around the time of Sylvia's murder. Other witnesses say that they saw a man with sandy blonde hair running down the alley by the store. Now, these are very interesting witness statements and detectives definitely wanted to speak to these two men. So they put their descriptions out to the media, urging these men or anybody with information to call them and just come forward. Detectives explained that they weren't accusing these men of being involved or being the killer, but that they believed that either one of these men were, you know, close enough to the store at the time to maybe have seen something and could help police find the killer. The guy using the payphone outside of the store could have seen the killer walk in or walk out. The guy running in the alley could have seen something too, so these men needed to be located and questioned. In the meantime, while detectives waited for that to unravel, other witnesses came forward saying that they had seen two other men who were together near the store. Detectives added those men to the list of men that needed to come forward, identifying themselves. No matter how hard detectives and the media pushed, none of the four men ever came forward or provided any additional information, which is shocking because I feel like you would remember if you were using a payphone outside the store where somebody got murdered. I don't feel like that's something that you would forget, so the fact that not even the payphone guy has come forward saying, hey, yeah, that was me, I didn't see anything, or I did see something, is shocking. However, as I've mentioned in other episodes, I know witness statements are very hard to come by. You know, when you're out and about, sometimes you don't even know that people are around you or like really analyze who's next to you. So it's understandable if this payphone guy didn't see anything because he just simply wasn't looking. However, I still do think that he should at least come forward and identify himself and just tell police that he doesn't know anything. That way police can just move on from this. Now, since these four men never came forward, detectives moved on and they interviewed a total of 20 men who they thought might be involved, but this never led to any real suspects. Investigators also tried to analyze a fingerprint found at the crime scene, but they didn't get a match to anyone in the system. Now, some neighbors suggested that maybe the robbery could have been related to drugs because just four blocks from the store on 35th Street, there was supposedly a big drug deal going on. So some of the neighbors thought 
thought that maybe these people were going to buy drugs. They went to the Salinas food store to get some money and things just went wrong and they killed Sylvia. Maybe the motive was just to rob the store, but Sylvia refused to give up the money and they had to kill her. However, I wasn't able to find more information about this. I don't know if police did look into this drug deal that was supposedly going on and if they cleared this theory. I feel like if that was true and these people did try to rob Sylvia to pay for the drugs, then she probably would have reached for the gun or the machete or at least triggered the alarm if she could tell that a robbery was about to happen. But again, she didn't do any of this, so I just feel like this theory doesn't make much sense. Eventually, Crime Stoppers got involved and they put a reward for $1,000 for anyone who had any information and they reiterated that anyone who called them could remain anonymous. In addition, the reward fund started by Cynthia, Deborah, and Sylvia's family had reached $2,000 in just a few days after Sylvia's murder. Cynthia said, quote, We need to bring justice and an end to this. It was murder and it could happen again. It is important to get the word out so we can raise some additional funds to encourage any anonymous informants to help us. She added that she just wanted to find whoever killed Sylvia. And again, she just didn't understand who did this. You know, they not only killed Sylvia, but they also killed a part of everyone who knew her. And this just goes to show how much Sylvia meant to the community and what an impact her death had on everyone. Now, even with the tip line and the reward money, Sylvia's case quickly became cold. Now, let's take a break from the investigation and let's talk about what Sylvia's family was going through at this time. On Friday, November 3rd, 1989, about 400 people gathered for Sylvia's funeral mass at Mission Reina de la Paz. 400 people is a lot. I mean, all those people showed up to let the family know that they're not alone in this and that they're there to support them throughout the investigation. She was laid to rest at the Lakeview Cemetery and during her funeral, everyone kept saying the same thing that this was senseless and that there was no reason for Sylvia to be gone from this world. Sylvia's family and her community were just shocked by this. You know, she was so well loved by everyone and they just couldn't understand how someone could be so evil to do this to her. Her cousin Jesse called it senseless and said that the killer didn't have to murder her just for some money, which I agree with. You know, I never understand why some robberies end with murder. I get that maybe sometimes they don't want to leave witnesses behind or anything like that, but still, murdering Sylvia over a couple hundred dollars is just so senseless. After Sylvia's murder, the store had to close for the investigation, and her family decided to keep it closed, and they actually put it up for sale. Her brother spoke out and said that he was praying for her sister's soul, and that he was also praying for the killer's soul. He said, if this was a deliberate act and purely an intent to murder, then yes, I ask for capital punishment. I thank God that myself and my family will not have to serve as judge and jury. But if it is proven that it was capital murder, I will pray for the soul of the killer and ask that he be executed. I just can't even imagine how Sylvia's family felt at this point. I mean, her parents had literally seen her the day she was murdered. They were at the store with her, helping her do some tasks, and then they just went to go have some lunch at their house two blocks away, and to know that soon after they left, someone came in and took their daughter's life is just so heartbreaking. I just don't understand who would do this to her. You know, was this spontaneous or was someone watching the store and waited for Sylvia to be completely alone to go through with their plan? Unfortunately, to this day in 2023, Sylvia Salinas' murder remains unsolved. Her family is still looking for answers and detectives say that the biggest driving force behind making sure that the case stays relevant is the family. Detectives don't want the case to go unsolved for so many years, but unfortunately, that's been the case so far. In 2019, Sylvia's great niece, Christine Taylor, had contacted ABC News when she had learned that they were running a special news segment on unsolved cases. Even though Christine never got the chance to meet her aunt Sylvia, she had heard stories about her throughout her childhood, and she clearly means a lot to Christine. When she saw that ABC was doing the special segment on cold cases, she thought that it was a sign from her aunt Sylvia to make sure that they never forgot her. And it was because of Christine's efforts that Sylvia's cold case was reopened by investigators to see if they could find something new. The year Sylvia was murdered, Galveston had only about 14 unsolved murder cases. Investigators continued to work them, and they actually ended up solving most of them, but unfortunately not Sylvia's. 
So as we know, the butcher knife was the one major piece of evidence that was discovered from the crime scene at the time, along with the bloody footprint and the fingerprint. Unfortunately, in 2008, Hurricane Ike hit Galveston severely and it did a lot of damage to all the property in Galveston, including where the police stored their evidence for a dozen of Galveston's cold cases, including Sylvia's. The only remaining pieces of evidence that remained after the hurricane was an old VHS tape that police had recorded of the crime scene the day of the murder. The video shows Sylvia's body, the knife, the open cash register, a giant but faint bloody footprint on the floor, and it also showed the crowd of people that were outside of the store just watching all of this unravel. Now, this video had never been released to the public until now, and it has become a key piece of evidence for the case 30 years later. Which is crazy, I mean, 30 years later, this VHS tape is finally released to the public, showing the crime scene, and it's pretty much one of the only big pieces of evidence left in Sylvia's case. Everything else besides the butcher knife was completely wiped out in the hurricane. Even Detective Michelle of the Galveston Police Department was herself surprised when she realized that this tape still existed. A partial fingerprint collected from the butcher knife was also preserved and as of March 2020, Michelle was planning on resubmitting that to a crime lab. They were unable to find a match for the fingerprint, which could mean that either the person who did this has never been in the system or that the fingerprint was not clear enough for them to use it to identify the killer. Early this year in 2023, another one of Sylvia's great nieces, Amanda Upton, sat down to talk to the host of Catch My Killer podcast. She said that it's been really hard getting more information about this case since so much of the evidence was destroyed by Hurricane Ike and that they have since struggled to get help. She said that the family wonders if anybody is ever going to get caught for what they did to Sylvia. The family still firmly believes that the killer had to have been someone that Sylvia knew. Amanda also mentioned that Sylvia was going through a breakup at the time with her girlfriend. I'm not sure if they were romantically involved or if she just meant a girl Sylvia was friends with, but to me, it did sound like a romantic situation, you know, just based on the way Amanda said it, because I think you would call a friendship ending a falling out, not a breakup. Now, this woman was supposed to stop by before Sylvia moved to Hawaii. Now, this is the first time that this girlfriend has come up. None of Sylvia's friends or family have ever talked about her in the initial investigation. And as we know, only men were interviewed as suspects. As for the Salina store, the building still remains intact, but it's boarded up. Since the family sold the store, no other businesses have come in tore it down, or even turned it into a parking lot. And to me, that just really shows the impact that this murder had on the town. No one ever wanted to do business there ever again. The case was reopened four years ago after ABC ran the news story, and it is still considered an open case, but the family has not heard anything from the police for four years. Now, there is a possibility that the killer is now deceased, but the family still believes that someone in the neighborhood knows what happened to Sylvia. Maybe the killer shared what they did with someone or even had a deathbed confession. Another interesting thing from the interview with Amanda was she said that if she wasn't mistaken, from what she was understanding, the knife came from the small meat market section in the grocery store. So she says that the knife came from there. If that's true, that really changes how we've been thinking about the case. Was this a planned robbery gone wrong since the killer did not bring their own murder weapon? Amanda still thinks that the murderer had a well thought out plan, the murder was intentional, and that this just wasn't a spur of the moment thing. But since this case is on Solved, let's go over some unanswered questions. Did Sylvia's murder know her well enough to know that she had a gun and a machete under the counter and how the security system of the store worked? Did the killer know about the silent alarm at all? There is confusion about whether the knife belonged to the meat market in the store or if the killer brought it with them. Now, while Sylvia's family couldn't recognize a knife, her great niece, Amanda, has said that the knife belonged to the store. So which is it and does it change things? Why did the murderer leave behind the murder weapon? You know, it is more likely for them to have taken the weapon with them because why would they just leave the evidence behind that could potentially get them caught? However, maybe they just walked out through the front door of the store and they knew it would look suspicious if they came out carrying a bloody knife. So that's why they left it behind. Now, Sylvia was stabbed viciously, so the killer must have gotten some blood on them. How did no one see another person with blood on them that day? Part of me wonders if the killer was maybe wearing a Halloween costume and that helped them with witnesses not seeing them or 
if they did see someone leaving the store with blood, it could look like it was part of their costume. Also, how was the killer able to get out of there so fast? Did they know that a security alarm was going to go off and were they prepared to run? I mean, again, everything happened within seven minutes. Going back to Halloween, you know, did the killer use Halloween to their advantage? You know, maybe they told Sylvia that the knife that they came in with was fake and part of their Halloween costume, which is why she didn't react to it. Also, how did they manage to only leave some fingerprints and no other DNA? Now, I know DNA evidence wasn't really a thing back then like it is now, but investigators still collected it, but they haven't had a match for it. Other people wonder if this was maybe a two-person attack. Sylvia was still sitting when the cops arrived and it seems odd that she wouldn't have fallen out of her chair. So maybe another attacker was there holding onto her arms and that's why she didn't fall over. I mean, there were two men seen together near the store around the time of her murder. So maybe it is possible. I know that was a lot. I just feel like there are so many questions that people have in regards to this case. And for now, we just don't know the answers to this. I'm sure the family is also wondering these things and they deserve to know Know what actually happened to Sylvia and who did this. Unfortunately, Sylvia's parents have since both passed away. Delis passed away in 2010 and Maria recently passed away in 2021. So Maria did get to see her daughter's case get reopened in her lifetime, but still, neither one of them got any answers about who did this to their daughter and why. Amanda thinks that the only way they will be able to get answers is if somebody comes forward. The investigation has not led them to any answers and so much of the evidence has already been destroyed, so the truth has to come from within the community. The family has been trying to spread the word about Sylvia's case on podcasts, you know, in the media. They've reached out to the police department maybe once a year to see if they have found anything new. Amanda urges anyone who knows anything about what happened to come forward and contact the Galveston Police Department at 409-765-3702. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can contact Galveston Crime Stoppers on their website or you can call them at 409-763-TIPS. My thoughts and prayers go out to Sylvia's family. I am so sorry that this happened to your loved one, and I just wish that this hadn't even happened in the first place. But since it did, I just wish that her killer had been found and had been prosecuted. You know, this person deserves to be punished for what they did, and it's very upsetting how so many years have passed without justice. Whoever did this has been free all this time thinking that they got away with this, and I hope that police never give up and that they continue to fight for justice. Sylvia seemed like an absolutely wonderful person who loved her family, loved her friends, loved her store, and just loved the community. She loved her neighborhood, and it breaks my heart that someone she knew did this to her. Again, I just truly hope that Sylvia does get justice. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, please leave me a comment down below so I can know your thoughts on this case. I would love to know what you guys think about this, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to what happened to Sylvia Sal if there's ever any other cases you would like me to cover, also leave me a comment under my YouTube video or send me a message on Instagram. But yeah, that is pretty much everything I have for today's case. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my channel, True Crime Jackie, on YouTube for full video episodes. You can also find me on Instagram and on TikTok at True Crime Jackie. Bye guys!